Professor Weiler, uh, you have been invited today in Geneva to deliver a speech on the European culture wars and the decay of liberal democracies. Uh, and without anticipating too much the content of your lecture tonight, uh, could you tell us briefly what do you think is the reason, the reason behind uh, the um, rising of these right-wing populist parties in Europe? Yes, so I have a premise which my speech is based on. And the premise is that I refuse to accept that suddenly over the last five to ten years, millions of Europeans have suddenly become fascists or idiots. Mm. So one of the problems in understanding it is that instead of listening and really trying to understand the deep roots of this phenomenon, people are dismissing it as bad people or stupid people. We just have to explain better the value of liberal democracy. And I have a second premise uh, that informs my analysis of this evening, that it's too easy to put it all down to economic factors, material factors. There's a crisis of values. In other words, there's uh, something about our politics of the last 30 or 40 years where, of course, we have to believe, and we do believe, and we wouldn't want to live in a, in a society which does not accept liberal democracy, rule of law, democracy, fundamental human rights. I call that the holy trinity mm -hmm. of European values, democracy, human rights, rule of law. They're indispensable, they're interconnected. That's why I use the metaphor of Holy Trinity. There's a fact, an aspect of the Holy Trinity which does not get discussed. In some way they are procedural values. In some way they're empty values. In what sense? It's a hard word, empty values. They don't satisfy the need of people to give meaning to their life because of this procedural and in quotes empty nature and then the so-called populist they do satisfy their need but the idea that you're not only telling you're not only giving people liberty but you're giving some significance to their life is extremely appealing mm, and, so and seductive so if I understand correctly, uh, you think that the politicians so far in these democracies have been much more paying attention to the shell rather than what is within the shell. So like... It's a little bit, not exactly that, because liberalism is a shell. That's what liberalism means. Mm -hmm. We give the individual the choice mm -hmm. to decide the destiny of his life. So it's not as if they disregarded the, the core of liberalism. That's what, what liberalism is about. It prides itself. The state is neutral. We guarantee your liberty. We guarantee democratic government. We guarantee the rule of law. But we don't give content to, to those. Yes. To those. Mm -hmm. Populism manifests itself in two ways. A, challenging liberal democracy. And B, widespread Euroscepticism. Mm -hmm. And we are not willing to accept that there really is and continues to be a serious democracy deficit of governance of the European Union. Can we really say that human rights do not contain or don't, don't base themselves on certain values such as the common human dignity of every human being? Is not this a sufficient value uh, on which to build uh, there are values there, and human dignity is what distinguishes Europe from the United States. It's the United States, the basic human right is liberty. In Europe, the basic human right is human dignity. But it does not translate well into the active lives of people. But there's something deeper. It's all about rights. What is citizenship without duties? And how do people experience human rights? They believe in it, but the way they experience it, most people don't have their human rights violated. Hmm. Most people, when they see a violation of human rights, they say, isn't that terrible, while they're drinking their orange juice at breakfast, hmm. and then they say, the government has to do something about it. Yes. It's never a call on individual action. That's true. 
to believe in human rights doesn't require you to change anything in your life. I understand. And what kind of other, let's say, values could we identify uh, if you should suggest to the rulers a, a sort of indications of values to direct our future or to direct our... So, first of all, the, the discourse has to change. There can't be all the time a discourse of rights. There has to be a discourse, the discourse of responsibilities mm -hmm. and duties. And that can manifest itself in a variety of ways. So here is a very unpopular uh, proposal. In most countries, we've abolished uh, conscription to the army. Hmm. But there could be national service, which is not military. Where everybody, as part of your citizenship, as a young person, you are called to national service, teaching, a whole range of social activities, dealing with migrants, etc. Why shouldn't what in the past, the Mussolini, it was the army, etc. But why can't there be national service which just becomes integral? If I'm a citizen of a country, I have to give something to my society which is not only paying my taxes. Mm. So in one way there is some consequence and some link between the two. Uh, because the, there is an obsession to respect to certain parameters. Uh, and even, you know, so some people say the European uh, Union is the paradigm of neoliberalism, etc. But even if it's not, and that's contestable, it's debatable, what the European Union and the market mentality introduces is that the measure of happiness, etc., is always prosperity. The big, the big preoccupation is occupation. If if we solve the problem of disoccupation, that's what we need to be doing. And I say, not on bread alone does man liveth. And it's that, just think of national politics and think of European politics. It's all an economic metric, Indeed. prosperity, occupation. And it's enough that people start thinking on the, of their own life. Uh, is that the only thing that interests us? Indeed. Thank you so much. You're most welcome. <laughs>